Okay, so that's 10 a.m. here in Texas. So i uh, just like to welcome everybody to this month's webinar for Amatex Solid State Controls. And we're introducing the Ascend Charger to uh, everybody. It's a new charger that we have designed um, specifically for transmission and distribution. Um, uh, we'll go over that today. Uh, my name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager. And with us today, we have Steve Weta, Director of R&D and Engineering. Hello, Steve. How are you? Uh, good. Doing good. Good morning, everyone. So as always, uh, just go through uh, a few checklists. First of all, if you can put in the chat bar that you can hear us okay, if somebody can put in there that you can hear us, that's always a bonus to start off with. Um, the platform that we use is called Webinar Jam, and um, it, has, uh, it has to process this um, webinar to uh, Android services, into uh, iOS, and into Windows. So there is some processing time for that to happen. So when you hear me and Steve uh, talk, you're not going to hear us until 15 seconds after we've said it. So when you put a question um, in the chat bar or in the Q&A section. Uh, we're not gonna see it until about 15 to 30 seconds after we're speaking. So what we tend to do is always leave the Q&A right until the end. And if you do have a question, if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, there is uh, in the, the chat, there is a chat function and there is a Q&A only function. If you want to put a question in, it's much easier for us if you put it in the Q&A only section uh, on the right hand side. Also, um, Webinar Jam has a panic button. So if we do start to see that people are saying that you can't hear us or um, something similar, uh, there's something wrong with the webinar, we can press the button, it will create a new room. Um, it will take us out of this room, create a new room, and we will carry on uh, from where we left off. Um, so that's a good function. Um, and also today um, is going to be a little bit more, um, I, I don't like to use the term uh, salesy, but it's going to be, uh, obviously we're introducing a new um, product into the market so we do have to go through a few things uh, we are going to go over the technical side of things as well and we really want to um, get your questions on the introduction of this charger um, but we are have we are going to have to go over some uh, sales stuff so a little bit of an introduction to uh, Amatex solid state controls and the markets that we supply so I can see on the chat bar that everybody's saying they can hear us loud and clear. So that is good. And the one last thing is the webinar probably is going to last our portion. Mine and Steve's portion is going to be about 30 to 45 minutes. And then we're going to hopefully have 15 minutes at the end um, to answer all of your questions. So today we're going to go over who is. Amatech and who is Solid State Controls, the customers um, that we're targeting with the Ascend Charger, the applications for that charger, uh, the key features of the Ascend Charger, um, the operation of a charger, and the comparison between the Ascend Charger and the DCR uh, charger that we have um, in the market presently. A little bit on the installation, maintenance, spare parts and service, and then value proposition um, at the end. Okay. So here's a salesy bit. <laughs> a little bit about Amatech. Um, Amatech is a global leader in electronic instruments and electromechanical devices. We're actually a, a huge uh, company um, in truth with you. We have sales over 6 billion and over 50% of our sales are outside of the United States. And we, uh, Amatech as a company, um, serves a diverse set of niche markets and applications. So we're really, uh, we focus on very niche markets um, uh, and really try and supply the best equipment for those niche markets. That's how Amatech works. We have 18 and a half thousand employees working at 150 operation locations in 30 countries worldwide. Uh, 
Uh, we've been on the New York Stock Exchange since 1930, and we just celebrated our 85th anniversary. Um, and we got to ring the bell. It was just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we're also a component of the S&P 500 index, and we have a long-term track record of strong growth and superior value creation for shareholders. See what I mean? A little bit salesy, but I have to read what's on the screen. So that's Amatech as a, a whole, as a company. Now, Solid State Controls was purchased by Amatech. Um, and so we are a division of Amatech, and we focus um, primarily on UPS inverters and uh, chargers. Um, and our mission statement is the purpose of our business is to provide continuity of electrical power to keep businesses in business. Okay, we want to keep your loads powered. Our headquarters is in Columbus, Ohio, and that's our manufacturing facility as well. So all solid state controls um, uh, machines are made in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we were founded in 1962. We are ISO 9001 certified, and we have approximately 255 employees. So when we say Amatech, that is the umbrella company. Solid state controls is the industrial UPS division within Amatech. Okay. Um, as I said, we're ISO 9001 certified to design, develop, manufacture, and service industrial power systems. And we conform to the following industry standards. So we have NEMA, IEEE, the uh, United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Intertech, IEC, NFPA, ANSI, uh, UL, and uh, what is the difference between that UL and UL listed, Steve? Do you know? Uh, there really shouldn't be uh, a UL and a CUL. Okay. Uh, the, the product is a listed versus a recognized. But the CUL okay. is for Canada. Okay. Ah, CUL is for Canada. There you go. I learned something new, as I always do. Okay. And Amatex product line, Amatex solid state controls power, uh, product line is mainly uninterruptible power supply systems. That's uh, a self contained unit that has a charger um, and an inverter inside it. We also do standalone inverters. We do power conditioners, which uh, we have uh, various different ranges. Um, we have a, a, an SCR controlled power conditioner. We have regulated transformer power conditioners. Uh, so there's a few varieties of power conditioners that we supply. They don't have battery backup. They just have is a transformer uh, power conditioner. We have remote bypass switches. We do battery chargers, rectifiers, nuclear equipment, ripple chokes and filters, fusible panel boards, and we also do monitoring and software. So we have a range of battery monitoring uh, solutions, and we have uh, what we call UPS view, which is a way you can monitor your UPS and battery systems remotely. Okay. And solid state controls as a division of Amatech focuses on industrial process and power generation. So uh, we deal with steel mills, power generation, nuclear power plants, petrochemical, oil and gas, and pipeline and transmission. That is the main target areas um, that we go to. And actually, uh, before I go any further, London just posted in the chat bar there. Um, and it's a question that we get asked regularly is, uh, does the uh, webinar get recorded? And the, the answer to that question is yes. And you'll be able to find that on our YouTube channel tomorrow. And the link, London has put the link in there. Thank you for that, London. And an important, I always like to bring this up. This isn't really salesy. This is actually something that I'm very proud of, and that Amatech Solid State Controls is very proud of. The design life of our systems is typically 20 to 40 years. Um, so yes, there is a premium to our products, but uh, the design life of our products far outweighs uh, the premium. Uh, most other systems that uh, you would purchase, uh, 
usually have a 10 to 15 year life cycle. But for us, um, 20 to 40 years, we have many, many systems that we still service on a regular basis that are 30 to 40 years old and they are absolutely running without any issues whatsoever, okay? Um, the markets that we serve, it's 80% North America, 20% international, um, and you can see on the left-hand side, many of the clients that we uh, service and supply uh, our systems to. So we're now gonna get into um, the market that we're targeting, the Ascend charger. Um, and that is basically the transmission and distribution uh, market. So obviously you can see on the screen there we have our first stage is the generation um, plant where the turbines are. Um, then we have the main transmission um, at usually the generation station. And then we have a transmission substation. And then um, that's really where uh, our ascent charges are going to sit either at the generating station, at the transmission uh, substation, um, where the batteries are there to supply switchgear systems. And we'll get into that in just a moment. So a substation battery charger basically ensures all of the essential electrical systems in a substation continue to operate in the event of a power outage. And, and this is critical. It's extremely critical in any substation that the tripping and closing uh, breakers can operate when there is a power failure in that substation because the the implications of not being able to open uh, a breaker when you have a fault um, are obviously extremely dangerous to people and to the facility itself. Um, there's been many fires uh, and, and other things when you cannot break a fault um, on your power system. So that's why we have batteries in the substation. So if there is a power outage, then the batteries are there to supply the tripping and closing power to the breakers and all the auxiliary supplies um, required to trip and close those breakers when necessary. So it's extremely critically important to have a good charger and a good battery in your substation. <laughs> So here's a basic overview of a substation DC system. Obviously you have your AC in as always to start off with, then you have some form of AC to DC converter that changes the AC into DC. The DC comes out and then that charges your battery system. And it also supplies power to the substation DC distribution system. The DC out of the charger and the battery are in parallel uh, supplying the substation DC distribution system and for us this is our brand new ascent charger in the bottom left hand corner that's where it sits in the infrastructure of the system so we have the output of the charger going up this way here we have our battery uh, sitting there and then basically all our other equipment is connected this is the substation distribution so you can have uh, some analyzers on there some uh, switch gear uh, metering and other auxiliary systems and the tripping and closing coils will also be connected to this dc bus okay so that is where our charger sits inside the system So this top right hand cor uh, corner picture here, this is our larger version of the Ascend charger. How many modules can it fit, Steve? Five. Five modules yes. in total, okay. Um, so this is our, la our larger system and you can see we have one, two, three, four, five modules in there. And then this is our smaller wall mounted system, okay. The input range for the charges just now, uh, we're only doing 208 or 240 volts AC in. Um, and it's, so it's a single phase input to our charges. And our output 
voltage is 135 DC at the moment. Is there any plans to do a 48 volt DC system? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Okay. So most substation uh, transmission and distribution substations, the DC voltage for all of the switch gear is usually a nominal 120 volts. So 135 volts um, is the battery voltage for those systems. And we do 20 amps, 40 amps, 60 amps, 80 amps, and 100 amps output. So basically, you can tell from there that our modules are 20 amps each. Now, basically, if you do the math, that means each module is 3 kilowatts. So that's 20 amps at 140 DC nominal, because obviously some batteries need to be charged uh, on an equalized charge. Um, so the two model enclosure does up to 40 amps wall mount with optional mounting stand, which we'll get into in a moment. So, uh, the, the wall mounted enclosure, uh, the maximum modules you can have is two. Is that correct, Steve? Yes, that's correct. Okay, cool. Um, and then obviously we mentioned earlier, we have five modules, uh, in the floor mounted enclosure. But here's an important thing um, that we've just finished a testing on with UL. Our, the new Ascend charger is actually rated to work at a higher temperature than our DCR chargers and our UPS systems. Um, it's 50 degrees Celsius. What does that turn out to be, Steve? 122 degrees Fahrenheit. 122 degrees Fahrenheit. That is, uh, you can use our charges up to that temperature and without derating, without derating at all. So that is a really good benefit to uh, this system right there, um, especially if it's going to be on a turbine deck or somewhere that gets very hot in the summer. Um, this will work out well for those applications or obviously uh, a substation somewhere um, where the AC system doesn't keep the room as uh, cool as we would like. And then the options we have is an input battery breaker uh, with auxiliary contacts and shunt trips. So the breakers on the system uh, can have position contacts um, and shunt trip con uh, coils. Um, we can add a battery breaker, which we'll go into in just a moment. We can do battery current and voltage measurement, and we can do battery temperature compensation. Uh, if you want to talk to this, Steve, um, why is low input current distortion uh, important? So the, with the low input current distortion, it's, it doesn't reflect any harmonics back into the AC source. So in, in an SCR charger, you may have some switching noises that would get back to your AC that then would affect other equipment connected to that AC. And uh, so what that does, and also the uh, lower power factor uh, also helps with the efficiency. Okay, cool. Uh, so in, uh, you can see underneath there, so that means no input filters uh, are required on your side, uh, usually um, if you're buying one of these because we have such low input distortion that's being reflected back to your uh, power generation system. Um, another uh, key feature is that this is modular. So uh, the mean time to repair is 10 minutes. Um, now you do have to power the system down uh, due to UL requirements to replace a module, um, but it's very easy uh, and it will only take 10 minutes for you to replace a module maximum. Um, each of those modules shares the load equally and they are redundant. They can be used as an N plus one system. So basically, if you only need 20 amps, you can still buy one of the wall mount chargers, buy two modules, and therefore you then have uh, N plus one redundancy. If one of the, the modules fails, then you have the other module to carry on supplying 20 amps as necessary. 
and our communications are NERC compliant. There is a USB communication port on the front of the system that you can connect a laptop to and get various information off, but that can be disabled um, using a, a jumper on the back of the board. Um, so you can have it so that USB is not accessible. Uh, we have Modbus TCP, RTU, SNMP, NTP, and optional IEC 61850 and DNP3. I've never heard of DNP3, Steve. Is that a new protocol? That's a protocol typically used in the substations. Okay, cool. Uh, and then we have supervisory level controls on the HMI. So many features can be reached through the HMI on the front of the charger. Obviously, the charger is UL listed. Uh, it has top or right side cable entry. We'll show you details of that in a moment. The enclosure is not screwed together. It is a welded enclosure, just like all of our other uh, equipment. So it's very robust, um, very well made. And each uh, module has uh, fans with redundant fans to keep the module cool. Anything else I need to add on that page, Steve? No, I think that's fine. Cool. So the Ascend chargers come in three various um, configurations. The first is the standard, which is the top configuration. So that's this one. Oop, sorry. This configuration here. I wish I could draw a little bit better. So you have AC input, uh, an input circuit breaker, and one output circuit breaker okay so when it says dc loads here that would mean you would have to connect your battery on the output of this system here and that way you cannot monitor the the battery voltage or the battery current separately um, it is all part of the overall uh, output dc of the system the second one is where you can have a battery connection we uh, supply terminals inside the charger where you can connect a battery internal to the charger and uh, therefore you can have a battery connected before this breaker here so if you do open uh, this breaker um, you can still keep the batteries charged um, you do get battery voltage and current measurements in that system and you can have battery current limit in that system um, and as you can see, this bottom square here, most lead acid battery manufacturers require current limit to the batteries to maintain the warranty. So um, if that's important to you, you would have to go with either this um, or this configuration. OK, the benefits of the third one, the battery connection with breaker is internal to the charger you can have a battery disconnect and an output disconnect. Um, we do have uh, the battery terminal connection. We can do battery voltage and current measurements as well as overall DC uh, current and voltage measurements. We have a battery circuit breaker and we can do battery current limit. So those configurations would have to be specified when you order uh, your Ascend charger but i'm sure the the sales guys and the reps have been um told uh that they need to ask these questions is that correct steve uh, yes okay. uh one question you have out there i don't know if there's a close-up picture of the module uh, most of those uh, pictures in this presentation were um, generated from cad not actual pictures Okay, um, but in that in that module itself, um, there are three indicators, um, LED indicators on the module, and I think we talked about it a little bit. So I may jump ahead here a little bit. Uh, one is AC inputs on, DC is okay, and a fault. You know, where that fault may be over temperature, uh, some shutdown issue. Um, and the current limit, uh, 
the if your module's in current limit, the DC OK will start flashing. So those are some of the additional features of that. It is it's, it's, as we I, I'll save it for the next one. I think we're talking a little bit more, but I don't think there's a close up on these. OK, but obviously um, and we'll discuss this later on. Um, you can call us or you can email us um, London will give those uh, details in the chat bar if you have any questions whatsoever we will be able to send you um, a close-up picture of the module I'm sure we can um, get that to you if absolutely necessary okay so uh, next up we have the animated touchscreen. So this is the HMI, HMI or the human machine interface. Um, this is what the front screen is going to look like. Um, we do have an animation of this, but unfortunately we can't put it into uh, the webinar uh, presentation. Um, so we're just going to have to talk through this for you. But it's a color graphical user interface, a GUI and touchscreen, and it will allow you to quickly determine um, what's wrong with the system if uh, or whether the system is running in normal or trouble operation. So you can see on the right hand side, we have two LEDs. We have a normal LED and we have a trouble LED. Now, obviously, only one of these is going to be on. So if you have the normal LED on, then that means the system is running without any issues whatsoever. Um, all is good. If anything if there is any alarm in the system whatsoever, the normal light will extinguish and the trouble light will come on. And then you can go in to the menus. Um, you can use this push button up here. We'll get, get into this in a little bit more detail uh, later. Um, or you can use this right hand uh, menu bar here and there's an alarm uh, button there to figure out what is wrong with your system. Um, the screen has animated power flow. So um, you can see this sine wave here that will be animated and also the power out to the loads and down to the battery that will also be animated. So it gives you a better indication of the power flow of the system so it can be seen very easily. Um, the display operates independent of the power modules. Can you explain that a little bit more, Steve? Yeah, so if, if uh, the modules were up and running or the display would fail the modules keep running okay um but the so that's independent of that where they just continue to run without the display okay so we do not need a display for the modules to run as designed uh we have obviously i've talked about the simplified green normal and red trouble um it's easy to navigate, uh, navigate between screens utilizing the docked menu. And what we mean by the docked menu is this menu over here on the left-hand side. That is available at all times. So uh, you can press any of these buttons um, and you'll get to navigate to wherever you need to go, go to. Um, it's very, very easy to work on. We've got one, uh, we've got a screen down here um, and it's it's been really pleasant to use um, compared to the old uh, systems that we had. Um, the display is powered even if the AC fails. So um, we use parallel uh, power supply. So we have AC and DC. So even if the AC input fails, the uh, screen will still remain operational. And obviously we have the front panel USB connection. So you can connect a laptop to the system and so can the service engineer if necessary and get some information off there that will be helpful um, if you have an issue. So here's um, the GUI, the graphical user interface in more detail um, at the top left you can see that we call this in the GUI um, uh, I would say industry it's a hamburger menu um, basically it's a navigation menu um, toggle button and then 
next to that, let me turn my uh, white whiteboard off. We have an alarm silence button. And then we have an, a lock unlock toggle bottom at the top. Basically, that is for uh, engineer uh, passwords. I'm guessing, is it the same as? Uh... Yeah, that's, so that's for the, the setup screens where it's password protected. OK, cool. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have here the battery control button and then the last one here is the uh, status the alarm status button so you can see on this screen here that it is green and uh, there is the number zero in there so there are no alarms on this system at present um, if that number if that box was red and you saw the number three in there it would tell you that there is alarms and that there are three alarms in the system. Uh, you can see on the right hand side here uh, an expanded view of what that looks like. Okay. For the, the battery um, icon, there are three, you can see here, there are three modes of operation. Green means the charger is in float mode. Yellow or amber means the charger is in equalized mode. And red means that the battery is discharging. Okay. Obviously, you can see here the difference between the locked toggle button and the unlocked toggle button. And then you also have this button here is whether the alarms are silenced or not. So you can silence alarms. Um, so that tells you which mode of operation you are in. So if it has the red uh, mark, it means that the, alarmed, the alarm silence button is enabled. And then this is what we called in the previous slide, this is our docked menu, is the navigation menu buttons. Okay, so we have at the top. Now, if we go back to the previous screen, you can see that this is the unexpanded view. Uh, if we go to this one here, that's the expanded. So it tells you here you have your mimic, and you have your alarms, metering, system info, info sorry, diagnostics, and set up. You got any comments on that, Steve? You also notice that it, it will tell you the number of modules in that mimic. There we are. That yeah. absolutely. So, in that circumstance, um, if there are two modules and one of them has failed, will it show as one module, or will it still uh, show that as box? Two? Will no, that box will uh, turn red. Okay. Cool. That is good to know. Um, we also have the monitoring features. We have a 2000 event data log viewable on the LCD with expanding event information. So um, if, for example, it says uh, low DC voltage, then you can click on that and it will give you an expanded uh, event information telling you what time and some other indications of uh, is, is it like the expanded data log on the DPP where it shows you some voltages as well, Steve? Correct, yes. Cool, okay. And there's also software available to download uh, that dialog to the computer. The USB, as I mentioned earlier, can be disabled uh, to meet uh, the NERC standards. Um, and the USB alarm can be fig configured if the USB B port is enabled. So what does that alarm do, Steve? If somebody plugs into it, you get an alarm or? Correct. If somebody um, tries to enable the USB, you would get an alarm. OK. Uh, the battery history log events are recorded. Um, is that separate to the 2000? It is. It is okay. separate. OK. And you have, obviously, we mentioned it before, the optional network connectivity, um, which you can enable, and that's Modbus TCIP, uh, Modbus RTU, NTP, SNMP, uh, IEC 61850, and DNMQ. 
sorry, DNP3, which is under well, it development. It should be completed here in the next 10 days. Okay, cool. So the standard configuration, so when we say the standard configuration, this is, if you buy a standard option, Steve, this is what you will get. Is that correct? So it, 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 we would configure it for whatever options, but uh, you get a common alarm and a communication failure alarm always. Okay. So then we have six alarm relays that can be configured for any alarm that's um, in the system. So the, the, the user can configure these alarms um, themselves. Okay, so they can choose six out of the plethora of alarms that the system gives, and they can route those to whichever relay they want. Correct, and but and all the other alarms will show up in the common alarm. Okay, and we also have an alarm test function. So once you have configured all the alarms and the relays that you want, if you want to on an annual basis if or if you have quarterly PMs at your substation and you want to test the alarms back to your control room, then um, we have a relay alarm test function where you can turn them on or turn them off and send that signal and make sure that the alarms are repeating to your DCS system. Um, you can choose to have latching alarms. So alarms can be enabled to automatically latch until they are physically reset by the user. Um, and that can be enabled or disabled by the customer without any uh, password protection um, problems. Uh, all users can go in and choose to have latching or unlatched alarms. And then uh, we also give you the option to have the battery auto equalize. So um, basically what happens if you have a power failure and it lasts longer than a specific period of time, is it 15 minutes? Uh, five minutes. Oh, it's five minutes, okay. If you have a power failure for longer than five minutes, then you can turn on battery auto equalize. And what will happen is when the power comes back on again, the system will automatically go into equalize operation. And then um, it has a few things that it does when that happens. It will turn off the equalize function when the batteries get to full voltage for a specific period of time to present prevent overcharging your batteries. Um, but it's a good feature, especially if uh, the substation is in a remote area. Um, it gets your batteries back up to full charge quicker um, if you have a power failure longer than five minutes. So the standard alarms are low DC voltage, communications failure, high DC shutdown, and high DC voltage. Uh, alarms changed from optional to standard. Um, what does that mean, uh, Steve? That means from the DCR. Oh, from the DCR. Okay. So all of those alarms beneath that are now standard on the Ascend charger. So you get negative to ground alarm, positive to ground alarm, AC input failure, battery near exhaustion, module failure, DC output breaker open and charger fuse blown. They are all standard alarms. And those new alarms on the right hand side, are they options or are they standard? And these are all uh, alarms uh, around the modules. So you can interrogate, you would get a common alarm for a module over temperature. Uh, and then you can hit that module and it'll tell you which module uh, is, the, is the culprit. Okay. You can interrogate the voltage and current of each module so you, and, and temperatures of the module uh, devices. Cool. So that's going to make it very easy to find out uh, which module has a problem. We also have circuit breakers. We have an AC input breaker. Um, and there's the specifics of the breaker there, DC output breaker. And then we also have the optional uh, battery input breaker. So, you know, if you're installing this system in a brand new um, 
substation, then you wouldn't have to uh, have an external DC breaker if you didn't want to. You could have the battery input breaker integral to the the charger. Um, that would save some space and some cost as well. And there is uh, terminals for both the DC output and the battery input, separate oh. terminals. Yep, separate terminals. Okay. And optional features um, we can supply are battery temperature compensation, uh, battery voltage and current monitoring, dual current limit input, and equalize inhibit input. If you want to talk to those and what that 120 volt AC activation means, Steve. Yeah, so uh, the, the 120 volt is to an equalize, so say um, you have a, a battery room and the fan fails. Uh, you may not want to go into an equalized mode to generate more hydrogen because your exhaust fan. So a 120 volt input into this signal would disable that. Okay. Uh, we could also do a 24 volt DC. Oh, that so we have an option of the 24 volt DC yeah. as well. Okay. Where that would in, instead of a contact closure, uh, it's a it's a voltage input that activates a relay internally. Okay. So here's a comparison between the Ascend charger, which is the charger we're talking about today, and our standard range that we've offered for a considerable amount of time now, which is the DCR charger. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see that the Ascend charger is what we call a high frequency charger. Um, and what that means is it doesn't use SCRs um, to change the AC into DC. Um, we chop the the AC and the DC up in a specific way, uh, which we call high frequency. What's the uh, frequency that we're doing it at? Um, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank here. Um, it's switching around 20, 25 kilohertz. Okay, 25 kilohertz. So obviously on an SCR charger, if it's a three-phase charger, it's 360 hertz. Um, this is uh, 20, 25 kilohertz, and that allows us to have a much better power factor and the input current distortion goes down because of that, okay? Um, the mean time to repair on these charges is much less because uh, if one module fails, the system can continue to power the loads with the other module um, and the modules can be replaced very quickly. Um, the repairs on an SCR charger can take much, much longer uh, because you may have to replace SCRs, do some troubleshooting, uh, find out if it's a control board issue uh, uh, and a failure will shut down uh, the charger. So on the DCR chargers or the SCR charger, uh, a failure will usually shut down the charger completely. But with the new uh, Ascend charger, if one module fails, the other module um, will continue or other modules will continue to power the loads. Um, and the input current dist distortion on an SCR charger is 25 to 35% THD. Um, obviously, you can see that that's reduced significantly uh, with the Ascent Charger. It's reduced to less than 5% THD, uh, which meets the IEEE 519 uh, without filtering. What's the purpose of that? Can you remember? That's the distortion at, the, at your connected point uh, where it keeps the um, current distortions and then and your voltage distortions to a to minimum to affect other equipment. Okay, so that's just uh, the IEEE recommendations for uh, distortion reflections from any piece of equipment, is that correct? Correct. Cool. cool. And then obviously the power factor on an SCR charger is anywhere between 0 0.75 to 8. And on our power factor corrected charger or a high frequency charger, you can see it's close to unity. So... Um, much higher efficiency, which reduces electric costs. You have anything on that page, Steve? I uh, do, do not. Okay. Now, you know, we're singing its praises. We're saying 
this, this is a fantastic new piece of equipment, but there are some things that the Ascent charger does not have compared to the DCR charger. Um, so that is the AC input available indicator, high low AC input voltage alarms, uh, input power and frequency monitoring, um, a fan failure alarm, but does the module have a fan fail alarm, Steve? It has a over temperature alarm. Over temperature alarm, okay. Um, we don't have a cabinet humidity monitoring alarm, a charge fail alarm, commissioning mode, battery test, ripple filter, space heater, or lifting eye bolts. So these are all things that you cannot get with the ESN charger at this moment in time that you can get with the DCR. And here's some more key characteristics comparisons. So obviously this, this column here is for the DCR and this one here is for the new Ascend charger. So um, you can get 480 volt or 600 volt three phase inputs um, to the DCR, uh, sorry, 208 as well. For the Ascend, it is single phase 208 or 240, um, which is usually more convenient in uh, substation environments. DC output, obviously you can get a much larger range uh, for the DCR. Uh, we can get up to a thousand amps, um, but with the Ascend charger, we can only get up to a hundred amps, but that's usually um, suitable for charging uh, any of the batteries in a substation uh, environment. The DC voltage, you get uh, four nominal ranges uh, for the DCR system and for the Ascend charger, it is a nominal 120 volt uh, system at this time. Technology is SCR for the DCR systems. It's high frequency for the Ascend. Um, and then we've discussed most of the other stuff. Uh, the, the ripple on that uh, is incorrect. It should be 0.1%. Oh, so that's 0.1%. Yeah. Okay. So you can see there that the ripple to the batteries is that's a significant increase, uh, uh, sorry, decrease in ripple um, that the Ascend charger uh, produces going to the battery. So that can, um, in theory, extend the life of your batteries a little bit more as well. So here's the uh, uh, installation guide. Um, well, not guide, but just tells you the options that you can get and the conduit uh, entry points. So for the 20 and 40 amp systems, it's a wall mounted uh, charger. It's 23 inches high, 18 inches wide and 18 inches deep. And it can be wall mounted. There's a flange here. Uh, it's difficult to see, um, but it's a flange here that has three uh, holes and you can uh, mount this to the wall or you can buy this stand and you can have it floor mounted um, on that stand if necessary. Okay, the stand height is 30 inches. Um, the power connections utilize compression terminal size for 16 uh, to eight gauge wire. Um, and it weighs 90 pounds for the floor mounted, uh, sorry, for the wall mounted system. And then for the uh, floor mounted enclosure, the 60 to 100 amp enclosure, its dimensions are 40 inches high, 18 inches wide, 18 inches deep. It has uh, four mounting bolt holes for mounting to the floor and the power connections utilize a quarter inch stud terminal rather than uh, the compression terminals mentioned above. And you can see these are the conduit knockout points um, for the charger to give you some uh, different points that you can access cables. So we're getting to the end here, maintenance and spare parts. Um, each module has status indicators, AC on, DC on and fault red. Unfortunately, we don't have a close up to show you that. Um, the power modules can be removed. There's two screws, one here and one on the other side here, and then the module pulls out. 
and replacing and adding a module takes less than 10 minutes. But because of UL, please remember the power must be removed from that module before it can be replaced. Although if it was not removed, there should not be any damage because it, we just, the connector wasn't UL good for that. Okay. That's good to know. So we cannot recommend that you hot swap them, but uh, because of UL, but um, there shouldn't be any issues if you yeah, do. It was, it was designed around hot swappable. Okay, cool. And you'll be glad to know that the warranty for the Ascend charger is five years for the parts. Um, so if any module fails within five years, um, it will be replaced. Uh, obviously, all costs associated with the removal and transportation shall be paid by the customer. But if you have a module failure within five years, um, we will warranty that module. Uh, requests for warranty claims must be placed via the Amatex Solicity Controls RMA instructions. So um, if you have an issue, we will send you a, an RMA. Um, at, the, at present, you will be contacting the service department as you normally would for your UPSs and uh, DCR charges, and we will process the RMA instructions for you um, for the first year or so until we figure out uh, a better way to do it. But um, we feel this is going to the service department is a one stop shop for you. Um, we think that's the best way to go to start off with. Um, and the value proposition is obviously the primary value um, that you get is modular design, which increases reliability, simplicity, and efficiency. Um, and it also gives you up to 94% efficient um, charger, which reduces power consumption. Uh, the primary benefit of input power factor correction is a THD uh, less than 5%, but it's also a reliable industrial design. And the mean time between failure uh, is approximately 205,000 hours. Uh, what does that equate to, Steve? A lot. <laughs> I thought you would know that off the top of your head. <laughs> I don't know that. I don't know that either. What do you have to do? Divide it by 24 to get days and then divide it by 365. It's a lot. Uh, we also have low input harmonic distortion, um, and it also gives you simultaneous voltage and current readings. And we have advanced switching and power electronics technology. So uh, uh, the conversion process is much more advanced than the DCR system. Um, and we also have user-definable control and alarm set points. So it allows you to be much more configurable um, once you get it into the field. If you want to add alarms and subtract alarms, you can do that. Oop. And delivery. The estimates at this moment in time is if you order between one and three Ascend charges, the delivery time should be four to six weeks. Um, if you order more than that, the delivery time may be extended. Is that correct, Steve? Yes. Okay. And now we can go to the questions. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to do the questions in the chat first. I'll go to the Q&A. Oh, there's only one question in the Q&A. Um, it says, can you please elaborate a little um, about the high frequency technology? So over to you, Steve. So the the high frequency, it, it, the, the power electronics basically go through a power factor corrected uh, input. So it's a single phase power factor corrected circuit uh, to a DC bus that's about 400 volts that DC bus is then into a H bridge using uh, uh, MOSFETs that is then switched to a high frequency transformer into a high frequency transformer as a, as a square wave. And then uh, on the output, there is silicon carbide diodes uh, rectifying that and then filtering it uh, with some capacitance on the output. 
so that's the the type of circuit that it is using. Uh, we're using MOSFETs and silicon carbide diodes. Cool. Yeah, I was uh, surprised to hear. So for for those out there who want the basics, it's basically we do AC to DC, DC to AC, and then AC back to DC again. Um, that's basically how it works and that's how we get the the good power factor correction uh, and the high frequency um another question is is there any plan to get cul or csa approval um it, it was missed we when we get ul we get cul along with it okay there so what no about with, do you know what no CSA is? CSA at the moment. we don't have csa correct okay is that canadian yeah it's a canadian standards association okay um, other than the USB on the front, is the other COM port, is there, I'm guessing it should say, so is the there other, other the, 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 There is a optional um, uh, Modbus RTU port or a Modbus TP, TCP port. Uh, we also have a, a, an internal port, which would be for the IEC 61850 and, and a separate one for the DNP three and we do have ethernet as well yes yes it's snmp okay and also uh they're asking will it support serial i'm guessing not um the only serial that it would be is the modbus rtu is a 485 uh, serial port okay okay let's see another question here in q a if you have any other questions, uh, everyone, please feel free to put it in the chat or the Q&A. The Q&A is the best part for it. Um, okay, they, they put the, it's the same ones in there that they've had in the chat. Um, how does high frequency charger compare with the SCR charger? Um, if you go back, I think three slides. Okay. Keep going. One more. Nope. Keep going. Five or six slides. <laughs> there we go. Um, go to the, the one before. That one. Okay. So, uh, technology-wise, uh, or performance-wise, it's it's really around the input power factor the input distortion and the output ripple. So with the high frequency charger, all those factors um, get improved. And, and based upon the uh, power factor, you also improve your uh, efficiency. So that's the big differences from a performance standpoint uh, with the high frequency. High frequency is, is certainly with the power factor corrected more complicated than the SCR. Um, the downside of the high frequency with the single phase is the fact that you're going to come to a point where you can't have any more single phase input current for your output current. You have to go to a three phase. The, the sale, the, the next sales pitch is we have a three phase uh, modular charger coming here in the next couple months so it'll be another seminar on that okay so i, I didn't ask because i didn't know what there was so we are going to do three phase module correct okay cool um i'm not sure this is something i know i can't discuss it i don't know if this uh, uh somebody has asked uh, what is the price uh i probably going to have to ask your salesperson with that um, yeah it, it kind of depends on who and where and 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 what kind of uh, distribution you have. Okay. Um, if you have something, um, you can contact L uh, London. She can direct you to the regional sales person. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you have any questions, we can direct you to the salesperson for your area. Um, Phil has asked, can we get copies of this presentation and a PDF of the owner's manual? For the first part, you cannot. 
get a copy of this presentation. Unfortunately, Phil, um, it is proprietary, but um, you can, you will be able to watch this back on YouTube and you can share that to whoever you want. So it's as good as a copy of the presentation. Um, a PDF of the owner's manual, is that possible at this time, Steve? It, it, hopefully in the next week or two, it will be on the Amatech uh, Solid State Controls website. Okay. So and a couple weeks under the Ascend uh, charger. Okay. And London's going to post all of these links in the, uh, the chat bar for you again, as well as necessary. Um, so that seems to be all of the questions we have just now. So what I'm going to do is, this is your last chance to put in questions and, and then uh, for the moment, I'll just take a time to say thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this webinar today. I know it's not quite as technical as we usually do, but um, we wanted to show you the benefits of this new charger that's going out there. I'd like to thank you very much, Steve, for joining us and giving us your technical expertise. Um, I know you were instrumental um, in the manufacture and design of this uh, charger, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, Enjoyed it. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I don't see any other questions coming in. So uh, right on 11 a.m. Wow. Yeah, only lasted an hour. That's a, a surprise for me. Are we there? Do we have one in the chat now? Oh, no, that's London putting in all of the information there. So, uh, oh, wait, there. Uh, there was one as well. Adrian asked, do you have individual connections for the battery and for the load? But yes, we did. Uh, cover that. We do have individual connections for the battery and for the load, but that's not on the standard system. That's on the uh, the other two options that you can get. What? How are they labeled again, Steve? Standard? Yeah, it was a, a standard. You would have a battery connection or a battery connection with a circuit breaker. Okay. Yeah. So you can do that. And you can see in the chat bar, London has put all the links there for you. Um, um, so that's fine. Okay. We have answered all the questions. So um, thank you, everyone, for taking time to watch this. Uh, we do know, especially all over the world, um, it's different times um, and your time is precious. So for you to spend an hour with us today, is uh, we really do appreciate that. Um, if you do have any questions, please do uh, don't hesitate to contact us. London's put them in there, so you can go to the Solid State Controls website, or you can email us at sci.marketing at amatech.com, and those emails will be routed um, as necessary to the person um, required to answer it. Um, oh, one last question. Would we expect the high-frequency technology will be used in industrial charges? Well, I would say that this is still classed as an industrial charger, wouldn't you, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think it. Um, each one would have its um, uh, application. Um, my personal belief is the high frequency is probably going to be something less than 200 amps uh, from a cost standpoint. I think, okay. you know, above that, you start getting into larger four, 500, 600 amp chargers. Um, it may not make sense. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, that makes sense. The higher output, then the SCR technology um, starts to come into its own on the higher uh, amperage systems. So, yep. So I think that's us covered everything. So uh, please look out for the email for next month's webinar and what it will be about. Um, as always, I ask everybody if you have any suggestions for what you would like next month's webinar to be about, please uh, contact SEI.marketing or when you get the, um, you will get a survey at the end of this. Um, and if you could put in what you would like to see the webinar discuss uh, next time in the survey. I read every single one of those, so um, it really helps me out, and it usually helps me find a topic for the next webinar. So until next time. One thing, oh, no, one one thing you may, if you want it more technical, let, let Craig know in the survey. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, if you want a more technical rundown of this charger, then um, uh, put that in the survey, let us know, and then we'll create a presentation to go into things a bit more technical. Thanks for that, Steve. Um, so everybody, thanks again. Take care until next time. And Steve, thank you very much for spending an hour with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.